I'm Laurie Glimsher. I'm the president and CEO of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and I've been here for a little more than five years. I started at the end of 2016, and I've just signed up for another five years at this wonderful institution. So I really did grow up at Harvard, I have to say. My dad, as you pointed out, was chair of orthopedic surgery, first at Mass General and then at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And he had also attended Harvard Medical School. I graduated from Harvard University and then entered the medical school um, 26 years after my dad graduated. And we were very happy because um, I won the Selma Weiss Prize as my father had done 26 years earlier, and that was the first father-daughter pair. We were also the first father-daughter pair of full professors at Harvard Medical School. So Harvard Medical School and all the affiliated hospitals have been in my blood since ever I can remember. And uh, yes, dinner table conversation talked about Mass General and it talked about Dana-Farber and Beth Israel. And of course, I knew all those institutions when I was a medical student. I, rot I rotated through all of them uh, doing electives. I uh, did most of my electives at, at Mass General, but um, and, and that's when I came back from a uh, three-year stay at the National Institutes of Health learning about immunology, which is my particular subject, and became uh, a rheumatology fellow at Mass General, and then I moved over to the Harvard School of Public Health as an assistant professor. Our first year at uh, HMS, as students, we learned all about immunology, and that's when I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, it was just fascinating to me that your own immune system could distinguish between which was self and which was foreign in an appropriate way such that if you were infected with a pathogen like HIV or um, bacteria or virus, you could fight it off but if your immune system was overactive, you developed autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, and it's really why I became a rheumatologist. Now, at the time, I really didn't consider oncology as a subspecialty because nothing was happening in cancer. There had been virtually no progressive new ideas, even though Many scientists were focused on activating the immune system in cancer. It was pretty clear that's what we needed to do, but there was just failures. Really for a hundred years, dating back from when William Coley, a surgeon in New York City, had made the observation that when he removed a tumor and the wound became infected, the tumor oftentimes would regress and he figured there was some endogenous system that activated some, and of course that's the immune system, that when it was killing off the bacteria was also killing off the tumor cell. And he had coli toxins, which he sold in bottles for a while, and then he was supplanted by chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which certainly have saved some people's lives. But the last two decades have been absolutely extraordinary which I would, I would classify as two major revolutions. One is the notion, and in fact, the fact, that cancers rise from a mutation, a genetic mutation. That's what calls a normal, causes a normal cell to turn into a cancer cell from genetic mutations. And that introduced a whole new area of exploration, which Dana-Farber really led the way in, with uh, wonderful scientists like Levi Garraway and Bill Hahn and others, searched for all of the genetic mutations they could find in many, many different cancers. And you can ask, well, why is that important to know what the genetic mutation is? It's important because if you know what it is, then you can develop a drug that will disable that genetic mutation that is causing the transformation of a normal cell into a cancer cell. And a great, a great example of that is 
the identification of the EGFR receptor by Pasi, Yane, and others, uh, about 15% of patients with lung cancer have mutations that overactivate that receptor. So they designed a drug that inhibited the EGFR receptor. The, we brought it far along in-house at Dana-Farber and then uh, collaborated with, with pharma to get the drug made. And that has given patients with lung cancer many more years of life than they would have had otherwise. This was the decade of precision medicine because not all cancers are alike. And even within a specific cancer, there are many differences. So for example, only 4% of patients with lung cancer have a mutation in a protein called the ALK kinase. And if you were to do a clinical trial of, a, of an ALK kinase inhibitor, and you did it amongst all lung cancer patients, that drug would never have been approved because only 4% of lung cancer patients had it. But when you do a small clinical trial, and that was done with about 80 patients who had that mutation, the response was dramatic. The tumors melted away. It was just stunning, really stunning. Now, that's not the end of the story because the tumor can be smarter than we are, and it can mutate again with another mutation. And that's something that we're focusing on very much right now. How do you circumvent drug resistance? And if you knew what that second genetic mutation was gonna be, then why not treat with two different compounds? One that tackles the EGFR and one that tackles another uh, genetic mutation. So if you think back to what made HIV a disease to, that people now can live with, I mean, a, a young man who gets infected with HIV at age 20 has a normal lifespan, and that is because the virus is attacked in several different places at once. That's what we're trying to do in cancer in precision genomics which is why the precision medicine profile was uh, instituted by Dr. Barrett Rollins, because you need to know the genomics of a patient's tans cancer. And we offered all patients free, free, well supported by philanthropy, uh, to have their tumor sequenced, because you have to know what the mutation is to know how best to treat that person. Now. Some mutations we still haven't developed drugs against, but as we move on uh, over the last decade, we're increasingly making more of those compounds in-house, and that's thanks to the fact that we have a really superb chemical biology group. That's very rare to have in any hospital, much less a cancer hospital. So the development of checkpoint inhibitors was a transformative moment. The first inhibitory receptor on the T cell was discovered by Jim Allison when he was at Berkeley. And that led to the production of a monoclonal antibody that inhibited the inhibitor. So the most important cell of the immune system is called a T cell. And you want your T cell to be active in the setting of cancer but not so active that it would explode into toxic side effects. So Jim Allison came up with the idea that you should find an inhibitor receptor that turns off the T cell and then block that. That became Yervoy, the first immunotherapeutic the second and more important one was discovered by Gordon Freeman here. And Gordon and his wife Arlene had identified activating receptors on T cells, really important for them to become activated. And that was a major, major success. That was a huge discovery. 
but Gordon felt there have to be inhibitory receptors as well. And from what he told me, he would, and he figured they would look something like the activating receptors. There'd be some genetic sequence that looked the same. And he looked every day through the human genome uh, consortium. And one day he found it, and that was PDL1. So that drug, which is known as Keytruda or Opdivo or Infinzi, really altered the field. Much more potent than the first one, and in combination, even better. And that now is successful in about 25% of patients who have certain ca ca uh, cancers. It doesn't work in some cancers at all. We call them cold cancers. But it does work now in about 10 to 12 cancers like melanoma. And I should add in here that those melanoma clinical trials were carried out here at Dana-Farber by Steve Hody and others, at, as, was, uh, as, as was the clinical trial for the first inhibitor, Yervoy. And because of this large clinical trial, that's why the FDA approved those drugs. So Dana-Farber, you know, if you look at over the last decade, I would say about half of all the new cancer drugs that have arisen in that period of time, Dana-Farber has its hands, its fingerprints all over, all over those compounds, whether they were developed in-house, whether the clinical trials were, were done here. Um, but it's just a very impressive, impressive movement forward, and I think I think, I personally think that Dana-Farber led the way with both those revolutions. Well, when you think of the future of immunotherapy, you have to remember that still only 25% of people respond to current immunotherapy. We really only have those two compounds, and we also have CAR T cells, which we can talk about a little later, but, you know, 25% is not enough. We want to be able to treat 100% of our cancer patients with immunotherapy. And this is why it is so important that Dana-Farber has such rich, talented researchers. I think we are the only cancer center where 50% of our faculty are researchers 50% are clinicians, and 90% of those clinicians are interested in research. And they want to do all they can to help the researchers, the basic science researchers. And that also is very unusual, I can tell you, at most hospitals. Here, we're intensely collaborative. We're not competitive. So when one of our faculty dis d just discovered uh, two or three new inhibitory receptors, he went down the hall to the clinician and said, I've done all the, the preclinical mouse studies. I think this might work in glioblastoma. And David Reardon then provides tumor samples from patients with glioblastoma. The two of them get together. They uh, are co-senior authors on papers in very high tier journals. And then they found a company to get it move along fine, because what was a little disappointing after the wonderful, um, the wonderful identification of those two immunotherapy drugs was that the next few years, pharma companies failed in developing other new drugs or looking at the uh, new targets that they had in front of them that had all been generated in academic medical centers. None of them worked. They worked in mice. They didn't work in humans. And so what I'm really excited about over the next few years is that both Gordon and Kai Worker Fennig have identified novel inhibitory receptors that no one else has discovered. And their companies are doing well making monoclonal antibodies, and so I'm very 
I'm very hopeful with that. I would, I would say in the next five years, I would be willing to bet because of the incredible talent here at Dana-Farber and elsewhere that we will be able to treat 50% of patients with immunotherapy. Making some progress in those cancers that are totally inured to it, pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, colorectal cancer mostly, I think we have some early data that I've heard from Dr. Kathy Wu, Dr. Reardon, Dr. Wolpin, that we may have figured out a way to bring those immune T cells into the environment of the tumor, and they become activated. So we'll see, but you know, we do so many clinical trials here, 1,100 a year. And, and, and that's critical, not only for research, but for our patients, because 20% of our cancer patients have no options except to be on a clinical trial. CAR T cells, just to explain it, are, is a living drug. You take out from a patient, a cancer patient, the T cells, which we know are the brains of the immune system, and we genetically manipulate them so that they will directly recognize the tumor but won't recognize normal cells because of proteins that are on the surface of the tumor cell. And the T cell has been genetically engineered to, to, to come right at those tumor cells. This was developed initially by Dr. Carl June at University of Pennsylvania and has spread to a number of distinguished cancer centers like Dana-Farber. And we have a very robust program here. So the CAR T cells can cure diseases that are of the blood. So lymphomas, leukemias, multiple myeloma. What they can't do yet is kill off solid tumors like kidney cancer or whatever. So there's a, it's, it's a very exciting new area and there's a lot of attention right now on trying to figure out how we can also make those CAR T cells kill off solid tumors. And there are issues, it's gonna to be tough, but I believe it will happen and we have um, several faculty working on CAR T cells, and also the latest is CAR NK cells. Those are natural killer cells. And natural killer cells are the first ones to come into the battlefield. They come right in first, and then after them come the T cells. And the interesting thing about natural killer cells is that they don't, they don't attack self tissue. So um, this is something my own lab is working on now, which is reminiscent for me because when I was a Harvard Medical School student, I studied, for the Soma Weiss Prize, I studied natural killer cells and with Harvey Cantor, who is another faculty member here, um, I was in his lab when I was a fourth year medical student, and we were able to come up with ways to identify natural killer cells. So I, I kind of feel like I've come in a big circle here. Um, but I think N CAR NK cells are going to be very important uh, in the future. And there are a group of people here at Dana Fiber working on it, and I think we're probably pretty much ahead of the game. Um, compared to other centers. So that's CAR T cells, and it's good for some liquid malignancies, but we need to do better than that. That's not gonna bring us to 50%, and not to 100%. And they're difficult to make. They're hard to manufacture. It's individual to individual. So it's almost a boutique. and 
you know, Dana Farber's totally committed to treating every patient. And we believe every patient, no matter what zip code they're in, deserves the highest quality cancer care. And so I think we need to come up with other ideas that will be, um, that will change the numbers of patients who respond to immunotherapy. And one of those possibilities is something that Dana-Farber has worked very hard on. I think really, I would say, we are ahead of, of other cancer centers, and that is therapeutic vaccines. When we think of vaccines, we think of viruses and bacteria. And we call those pretty much, those are, those are preventive vaccines. You know, you get your shots, you get your tetanus shot, you get your measles, mumps, rubella, and you're protected. This is therapeutic vaccines at this point. And uh, Kathy Wu, one of our, who heads our uh, division of bone marrow transplant and uh, cell therapy, has been making vaccines for patients with a number of different diseases. She started out with melanoma. She had a group of melanoma patients who were very far along and really on death's door and had not responded to the PD-1, PD-L1. She made an individualized vaccine from the tumors of each of those patients treated them with the vaccine, the therapeutic vaccine, and some of them also with the PD-1, PD-L1. Those patients largely are still alive several years later, which is pretty amazing because they really were on death's door with metastatic disease. Given the success of that, she's moved on working closely with clinicians, with Tony Chueri and kidney, with Brian Wolpen on pancreatic, with Ursula on um, ovarian, and uh, with David Reardon on glioblastoma to design vaccines for those diseases. And those are now in clinical trials. It's a, a very exciting thought. I would go one step beyond that. If these vaccines help, then we ought to be talking about preventive vaccines. Wouldn't it be great if my grandchildren could be immunized at the same time with an anti-cancer vaccine as they're getting their MMR? How great would that be? And uh, that's a future. Um, 10 years, 15 years, I don't know but uh, I think it can be done. And that really brings us into the wonderful area of early cancer detection. Because, you know, when patients come to us with stage one cancer, that's about 25% of our patients, we can cure them by surgery, maybe followed by some radiation and chemotherapy. But if the tumor hasn't spread, you have a, over a 90% chance of being cured. But 75% of our patients come in and the tumor has already spread. It has metastasized. It's tougher to cure those patients. And many of them do end up dying, although they can get extra years of survival um, that they wouldn't have otherwise, and that's something good. And this, I think, is the future. We've launched a couple of centers of early detection, high risk, and prevention, and looking at minimal residual disease to make sure that when we treat somebody who we believe is only stage one, is, are there still any cancer cells floating around? that we've missed and that can announce themselves years later. That's minimal residual disease. That's one important thing. Because, you know, if you take a, a cancer like breast cancer, about 20% of women 
who we think we've cured will develop metastatic breast cancer can be 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later. And all of a sudden, you have widely metastatic breast cancer. So we need to be able to pick up those few cancer cells. And there are many technical ways to do that now. There's uh, circulating DNA. There's circulating cancer cells. And we're making good progress, doing a lot of innovative things here to detect those. But let's go back to other ways of prevention. And that is to pick up a cancer very early. So again, to pick up a cancer very early, can you do a blood sample? There are a lot of companies out there who are working on that, and we are working on that as well. Because if you can get something in its early stage, you can treat it and you can cure it. So, you know, right now we spend most of our time coming up with treatments for patients who have, whose cancer has already spread. And that's important. We need to continue doing that. But it would be a different world if we could detect cancer early. 10% of cancers are inherited. Nobody with an inherited cancer should be allowed to develop that cancer whether you have a BRCA1 gene, which one in 40 Ashkenazi Jewish women have, or whether you have one of the mutations that leads to a syndrome named after Henry Lynch, the, our Lynch syndrome, because one out of every 300 people have one of those mutations, and they're at high risk for colorectal cancer, for pancreatic cancer, for uterine cancer. So now, Sapna Signal has set up a software program whereby as soon as we see a patient who has colorectal cancer, their mm -hmm. tumor sequenced, if they have any of those mutations, we take the whole extended family in, uncles, aunts, cousins, and so forth, to see do they have the mutation. And if they do, we say, okay, you're gonna have to have a colonoscopy every six months. It's not the most fun thing to do, but it's a heck of a lot better than presenting with widely spread colorectal cancer or uterine cancer. You know, as, as a researcher or as a clinician, you can choose to be competitive or you can choose to be collaborative. And I have never seen an institution like Dana-Farber intensely collaborative. And I think that's, you know, that comes from the mission here. The mission that everybody embraces at Dana-Farber. Again, I've never been in an institution, to a, in a hospital, where the mission is so clear and is so supported by everybody, by faculty, by staff, by our valets, by our janitors, you name it. We are a place where we take care of each other and we take care of our patients, and our patients come first. And whatever is best for the patient, that's what we'll do. And, you know, you could see that during the two years of COVID, that our nurses, our administrators, our physicians, nobody complained. Nobody said, you know, I can't do this anymore. And I've heard people say, you know, I don't know why everybody thinks we're heroes. We're not heroes, we're just doing our job because that's what we signed up for. We have collaboration in our DNA at Dana-Farber, we really do. So we reach out to all of the affiliated institutions and all the institutions in the Boston life science ecosystem. This is the number one life science ecosystem in the world. We're fortunate to be in Boston. Why not take, take advantage of all the wonderful ideas and technologies and everything else um, that exists in Boston? So yes, we interact with all of our affiliates. We interact with the Broad, with MIT, with UMass, with Tufts, and with pharma companies. 
and with biotech, we we are so fortunate to be in this setting, and everybody at Dana Farber participates in this. And I think Dana Farber really reigns in number one in not being competitive, but really just saying what can we do for our patients that can help them. And if that means bringing a lot of other people in who will also get a lot of credit, great. So I spent a lot of my time throughout my career trying to help women succeed. And now in this stage of my career, I continue that, but it's broadened out to people of color. You know, I grew up with a father and Two, and a mother who was a house, house worker. I had two sisters, no brothers. And we were told by our parents, you are going to be independent, you're going to have your own careers, and that's what you're going to do. So I got that from the beginning. And actually, my dad was the first chair of orthopedic surgery at MGH and then at Boston Children's Hospital who recruited female orthopedic surgeons. So I spent a lot of time earlier in my career um, recruiting women, uh, bolstering them, putting my money where our mouth was. If a woman had young children, I gave her a technician so that she was on an equal playing ground. I started a program at the NIAID whereby anybody with an R01 could apply for technician help for young women. As I said, you have to put your money where your mouth is, and so I've raised, when I was at Well Cornell and at Dana-Farber, multi-million dollars for women in science and medicine. But I think with the COVID pandemic really showed us was how poorly we were doing in people of color. We weren't seeing enough patients of color. We didn't have enough faculty of color or staff. And, you know, I, I am passionately dedicated to this. So we have committed $50 million of philanthropy over the next five years to try to fix that. We need more senior leaders who are people of color. I get down in the weeds to make sure that our, that our new assistant professors are diverse. So in 2021, of the 10 or so young people that we recruited to Dana-Farber, whether they were clinicians or researchers, more than half are people of color, and the majority of them are women. So you just can't lose sight of it. You have to focus on it. And it's going to take a while. We're not where we should be. But I think we're making progress. So you asked me earlier, what was the biggest surprise when I got to Dana-Farber? And, you know, I had collaborated with many, many of the researchers at Dana-Farber because, as you know, the quality of the researchers here is incredible, in absolutely incredible. And I knew that because I worked with some of them. I worked. Ken Anderson and Harvey Cantor and a whole bunch of them. What I didn't appreciate at all, and probably that was because I was really just a scientist at that point, was the exceptional care that is delivered here. Truly exceptional care. And, you know, the first week I was here, I had a woman come up to me and ask me, are you Dr. Glimpshire? And I said, yes, I am, she said, because I want to ask you a question. I said, sure, go ahead. And she said, I've just been told that my brain, that my breast cancer has been cured and I don't need to come back here anymore. But, she said, I have a family here, my team. I mean, we're good friends now and I miss them. Would it be okay if I just stop by? Occasionally, I won't take up their time just to say hello again. And of course I said, of course you can. And over the last five years, I have received literally hundreds of emails, letters, phone calls from either patients or from their family members after their loved one has died, saying, 
you know, you gave my husband six months that he wouldn't have had otherwise, or we have never experienced anywhere else in any hospital we've been in the quality of care that you deliver at Dana-Farber. The team you put together, the compassion, the, the gentleness, the time, the time that they all spend with us, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, usually when somebody calls the CEO, it's because they've had a bad experience. Never. I have never gotten one of those. And that just makes me so proud. Um, and, you know, getting up in the morning and coming into work, all I have to do is think of all those hundreds of patients who have told me how much Dana-Farber has meant for them. It is truly extraordinary. I, I can't emphasize this enough because I've never seen it anywhere else.